Chapter 4, Mullah Hussein's Journey to Tehran With these noble words ringing in his ears, Mullah Hussein embarked upon his perilous enterprise. Wherever he went, to whatever class of people he addressed himself, he delivered fearlessly and without reserve the message with which his beloved master had entrusted him. Arriving in Isfahan, he established himself in the Madrisi of Nim Avart. Around him gathered those who on his previous visit to that city had known him as the favoured messenger of Seyyid Qasim to the eminent Mushtahid Haji Seyyid Mohammed Bakir. He, being now dead, had been succeeded by his son, who had just returned from Najaf and was now established upon the seat of his father. Haji Muhammad Ibrahim i Kalbasi had also fallen seriously ill and was on the verge of death. The disciples of the late Haji Seyyid Muhammad Bakir, now freed from the restraining influence of their departed teacher, and alarmed at the strange doctrines which Mullah Hussein was propounding, vehemently denounced him to Haji Seyyid Asadullah, the son of the late Haji Seyyid Muhammad Bakir. Mullah Hussein, they complained, was able in the course of his last visit to win the support of your illustrious father to the cause of Sheikh Ahmad. No one among the Seed's helpless disciples dared to oppose him. He now comes as the upholder of a still more formidable opponent, and is pleading his cause with still greater vehemence and vigour. He is persistently claiming that he whose cause he now champions is the revealer of a book which is divinely inspired, and which bears a striking resemblance to the tone and language of the Koran. In the face of the people of this city he has flung these challenging words, Produce one like it if you are men of truth. The day is fast approaching when the whole of Isfahan will have embraced his cause. Haji Seyyid Asadullah returned evasive answers to their complaints. What am I to say? He was at last forced to reply. Do you not yourselves admit that Mullah Hussein has, by his eloquence and the cogency of his argument, silenced a man no less great than my illustrious father? How can I, then, who am so inferior to him in merit and knowledge, presume to challenge what he has already approved? Let each man dispassionately examine these claims. If he be satisfied, well and good. If not, let him observe silence, and not incur the risk of discrediting the fair name of our faith. Finding that their efforts had failed to influence Haji Seyyid Asadullah, his disciples referred the matter to Haji Muhammad Ibrahim i Kalbasi. Woe betide us, they loudly protested, for the enemy has risen to disrupt the holy faith of Islam. In lurid and exaggerated language, they stressed the challenging character of the ideas propounded by Mullah Hussein. Hold your peace, replied Haji Muhammad Ibrahim. Mullah Hussein is not the person to be duped by anyone, nor can he fall a victim to dangerous heresies. If your contention be true, if Mullah Hussein has indeed espoused a new faith, it is unquestionably your first obligation to inquire dispassionately into the character of his teachings and to refrain from denouncing him without previous and careful scrutiny. If my health and strength be restored, it is my intention, God willing, to investigate the matter myself and to ascertain the truth. This severe rebuke, pronounced by Haji Kalbasi, greatly disconcerted the disciples of Haji Seyyid Asadullah. In their dismay, they appealed to Manichir Khan, the Mutamidur Dawle, the governor of the city. That wise and judicious ruler refused to interfere in these matters, which he said fell exclusively within the jurisdiction of the ulamas. He warned them to abstain from mischief and to cease disturbing the peace and tranquility of the messenger. His trenchant words shatter the hopes of the mischief makers. Mullah Hussein was thereby relieved from the machinations of his enemies, and for a time pursued untrammeled the course of his labours. The first to embrace the cause of the Bab in that city was a man, a sifter of wheat, who, as soon as the call reached his ears, unreservedly accepted the message. With marvellous devotion, he served Mullah Hussein, and through the, his close association with him became a zealous advocate of the new revelation. A few years later, when the soul-stirring details of the siege of the fort of Sheikh Taubasi were being recounted to him, he felt an irresistible impulse to throw in his lot with those heroic companions of the Bab who had risen for the defence of their faith. Carrying his sieve in his hand, 
he immediately arose and set out to reach the scene of that memorable encounter. Why leave so hurriedly? his friends asked him as they saw him running in a state of intense excitement through the bazaars of Isfahan. I have risen, he replied, to join the glorious company of the defenders of the fort of Sheikh Talbasi. With, his, with this sieve, which I carry with me, I intend to sift the people in every city through which I pass. Whomsoever I find ready to espouse the cause I have embraced, I will ask to him to join me and hasten forthwith to the field of martyrdom. Such was the devotion of this youth that the Bab, in the Persian Bayan, refers to him in such terms, Isfahan, that outstanding city, is distinguished by the religious fervor of its Shia inhabitants by the learning of its divines and by the keen expectation shared by high and low alike of the imminent coming of the Sahib Buz Saman. In every quarter of that city religious institutions have been established, and yet, when the messenger of God had been made manifest, they who claim to be the repositories of learning and the expounders of the mysteries of the faith of God rejected his message. Of all the inhabitants of that seat of learning, only one person, a sifter of wheat, was found to recognize the truth and was invested with a robe of divine virtue. There is a footnote. Behold the land of Sad, Isfahan, which in this world of appearances is the greatest of lands. In every one of its schools numerous slaves are found who bear the name of savants and contestants. At the time of the election of members, even a sifter of grain may put on the garb of primacy above the others. It is here that the secret of the word of the Imams regarding the manifestation shines forth. The lowliest of the creatures shall become the most exalted, and the most exalted shall become the most debased. The Persian Bayan, Volume 4, page 113. Among the Seeds of Isfahan, a few, such as Mirza Muhammad Ali Inari, whose daughter was subsequently joined in wedlock with the most great branch, reference to Abdul Baha's marriage with Muniri Khanum, Mirza Hadi, the brother of Mirza Muhammad Ali and Mirza Muhammad Rizai I Pa Kali, recognized the truth of the cause. Mullah Sadiq I Khurasani, formerly known as Muqaddas and surnamed by Baha'u'llah Ismul Lahul Azdaq, who, according to the instructions of Syed Kazim, had during the last five years been residing in Isfahan and had been preparing the way for the advent of the new revelation, was also among the first believers who identified themselves with the message proclaimed by the Bab. As soon as he learned of the arrival of Mullah Hussein in Isfahan, he hastened to meet him. He gives the following account of his first interview, which took place at night in the home of Mirza Muhammad Ali Inari. I asked Mullah Hussein to divulge the name of him who claimed to be the promised manifestation. He replied, to inquire about that name and to divulge it are alike forbidden. Would it then be possible, I asked, for me, even as the letters of the living, to seek independently the grace of the all-merciful and through prayer to discover his identity? The door of his grace, he replied, is never closed before the face of him who seeks to find him. I immediately retired from his presence and requested his host to allow me the privacy of a room in his house where, alone and undisturbed, I could commune with God. In the midst of my contemplation, I suddenly remember the face of a youth whom I had often observed while in Karbila, standing in an attitude of prayer, with his face bathed in tears at the entrance of the shrine of the Imam Hussein. That same countenance now reappeared before my eyes. In my vision I seemed to behold that same face, those same features, expressive of such joys as I could never describe. He smiled as he gazed at me. I went towards him, ready to throw myself at his feet. I was bending towards the ground when, lo, that radiant figure vanished from before me. Overpowered with joy and gladness, I ran out to meet Mullah Hussein, who, with transport, received me and assured me that I had at last attained the object of my desire. He bade me, however, repress my feelings. Declare not your vision to anyone, he urged me. The time for it has not yet arrived. You have reaped the fruit of your patient waiting in Isfahan. You should now proceed to Kirman, and there acquaint Haji Mirza Karim Khan with this message. From that place you should travel to Shiraz, and endeavor to rouse the people of that city from their heedlessness. 
I hope to join you in Shiraz and share with you the blessings of a joyous reunion with our beloved. From Isfahan, Mullah Hussein proceeded to Kashan. The first to be enrolled in that city among the company of the faithful was a certain Haji Mirza Jani, surnamed Pa Pa, who was a merchant of note. Among the friends of Mullah Hussein was a well-known divine, Sid Abdul Baki, a resident of Kashan and a member of the Sheikhi community. Although intimately associated with Mullah Hussein during his stay in Najaf and Kabila, the Seyyid felt unable to sacrifice rank and leadership for the message which his friend had brought him. Arriving in Qum, Mullah Hussein found its people utterly unprepared to heed his call. The seed he sowed among them did not germinate until the time when Baha'u'llah was exiled to Baghdad. In those days, Haji Mirza Musa, a native of Qum, embraced the faith, journeyed to Baghdad, and there met Baha'u'llah. He eventually quaffed the cup of martyrdom in his path. From Qum, Mullah Hussein proceeded directly to Tehran. He lived, during his stay in the capital, in one of the rooms which belonged to the Madrisi of Mirza Sali, better known as the Madrisi of Pei i Minar. Haji Mirza Muhammad i Khurasani, the leader of the Sheikhi community in Tehran, who acted as an instructor in that institution, was approached by Mullah Hussein, but failed to respond to his invitation to accept the message. We had cherished the hope, he said to Mullah Hussein, that after the death of Syed Qasim, you would strive to promote the best interests of the Sheikhi community, and would deliver it from the obscurity into which it has sunk. You seem, however, to have betrayed its cause. You have shattered our fondest expectations. If you persist in disseminating these subversive doctrines, you will eventually extinguish the remnants of the Sheikhis in this city. Mullah Hussein assured him that he had no intention of prolonging his stay in Tehran, that his aim was in no wise to abase or suppress the teachings inculcated by Sheikh Ahmad and Syed Qasim. During his stay in Tehran, Mullah Hussein each day would leave his room early in the morning and would return to it only an hour after sunset. Upon his return, he would quietly and alone re-enter his room, close the door behind him, and remain in the privacy of his cell until the next day. Mirza Musa, Akhe i Kalim, the brother of Baha'u'llah, recounted to me the following. I have heard Mullah Muhammad i Mualim, a native of Nur, in the province of Mazindaran, who was a fervent admirer of both Sheikh Ahmad and Syed Qasim, relate this story. I was in those days recognized as one of the favored disciples of Haji Mirza Muhammad, and lived in the same school in which he taught. My room adjoined his room, and we were closely associated together. On the day that he was engaged in discussion with Mullah Hussein, I overheard their conversation from beginning to end, and was deeply affected by the ardor, the fluency, and learning of that youthful stranger. I was surprised at the evasive answers, the arrogance and contemptuous behavior of Haji Mirza Muhammad. That day I felt strongly attracted by the charm of that youth and deeply resented the unseemly conduct of my teacher towards him. I concealed my feelings, however, and pretended to ignore his discussions with Mullah Hussein. I was seized with a passionate desire to meet the latter and ventured at the hour of midnight to visit him. He did not expect me, but I knocked at his door and found him awake, seated beside his lamp. He received me affectionately and spoke to me with extreme courtesy and tenderness. I unburdened my heart to him, and as I was addressing him, tears which I could not repress flowed from my eyes. I can now see, he said, the reason why I have chosen to dwell in this place. Your teacher has contemptuously rejected this message and despised its author. My hope is that his pupil may, unlike his master, recognize its truth. What is your name, and which city is your home? My name, I replied, is Mullah Muhammad, and my surname, Mualim. My home is Nur, in the province of Mazindaran. Tell me, further inquired Mullah Hussein, is there today among the family of the late Mirza Bazurg Inuri, who was so renowned for his character, his charm, and artistic and intellectual attainment, anyone who has proved himself capable of maintaining the high traditions of that illustrious house? Yes, I replied. Among his sons now living, one has distinguished himself by the very traits which characterized his father. By his virtuous life, his high attainments, his loving kindness and liberality, he has proved himself a noble descendant of a noble father. What is his occupation? he asked me. He ch 
cheers the disconsolate and feeds the hungry, I replied. What of his rank and position? He has none, I said, apart from befriending the poor and the stranger. What is his name? Hussein Ali. In which of the scripts of his father does he excel? His favorite script is Shikasti Nastalik. How does he spend his time? He roams the woods and delights in the beauties of the countryside. What is his age? Eight and twenty. The eagerness with which Mullah Hussein questioned me, and the sense of delight with which he welcomed every particular I gave him, greatly surprised me. Turning to me, with his face beaming with satisfaction and joy, he once more inquired, I presume you often meet him? I frequently visit his home, I replied. Will you, he said, deliver into his hands a trust from me? Most assuredly, was my reply. He then gave me a scroll wrapped in a piece of cloth and requested me to hand it to him the next day at the hour of dawn. Should he deign to answer me, he added, will you be kind enough to acquaint me with his reply? I received the scroll from him and at the break of day arose to carry out his desire. As I approached the house of Baha'u'llah, I recognized his brother, Mirza Musa, who was standing at the gate and to whom I communicated the object of my visit. He went into the house and soon reappeared bearing a message of welcome. I was ushered into his presence and presented the scroll to Mirza Musa, who laid it before Baha'u'llah. He bade us both be seated. Unfolding the scroll, he glanced at its contents and began to read aloud to us certain of its passages. I sat enraptured as I listened to the sound of his voice and the sweetness of its melody. He had read a passage of the scroll when, turning to his brother, he said, Musa, what have you to say? Verily I say, whoso believes in the Koran and recognizes its divine origin and yet hesitates, there would be for a moment to admit that these soul-stirring words are endowed with the same regenerating power as most assuredly erred in his judgment and are strayed far from the path of justice. He spoke no more. Dismissing me from his presence, he charged me to take Mullah Hussein as a gift from him, a loaf of Russian sugar and a package of tea, and to convey to him the expression of his appreciation and love. I rose and, filled with joy, hastened back to Mullah Hussein and delivered to him the gift and message of Baha'u'llah. With what joy and exultation he received them from me, words fail me to describe the intensity of his emotion. He started to his feet, received with bowed head the gift from my hand, and fervently kissed it. He then took me in his arms, kissed my eyes, and said, My dearly beloved friend, I pray that even as you have rejoiced my heart, God may grant you eternal felicity and fill your heart with imperishable gladness. I was amazed at the behavior of Mullah Hussein. What could be, I thought to myself, the nature of the bond that unites these two souls? What could have kindled so fervid a fellowship in their hearts? Why should Mullah Hussein, in whose sight the pomp and circumstance of royalty were the merest trifle, have evinced such gladness of the sight of so inconsiderable a gift from the hands of Baha'u'llah? I was puzzled by this thought and could not unravel its mystery. A few days later, Mullah Hussein left for Khurasan. As he bade me farewell, he said, Breathe not to anyone what you have heard and witnessed. Let this be a secret hidden within your heart. Divulge not his name, for they who envy his position will arise to harm him. In your moments of meditation, pray that the Almighty may protect him, that through him he may exalt the downtrodden, enrich the poor, and redeem the fallen. The secret of things is concealed from our eyes. Ours is the duty to raise the call of the new day and to proclaim this divine message unto all people. Many a soul will in this city shed his blood in this path. That blood will water the tree of God, will cause it to flourish and to overshadow all mankind.